Thank you for joining me. This is the first of a two-part tutorial on imaging and understanding of FDG PET for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. I'm Christopher Rowe. I'm a nuclear medicine physician and neurologist, director of the Australian Dementia Network and director of molecular imaging research at Austin Health. And I'd like to thank Dr. Naomi Shea who assisted in the preparation of these talks. A bit of background, correct diagnosis and prognosis of the dementias is hard. Clinical criteria for Alzheimer's disease have only a sensitivity of about 70 to 80% and a specificity of 70% when compared to post-mortem eventual diagnosis. And there's numerous publications supporting this and here are just two. It's also been noted that 30% of patients with a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease referred to clinical trials for treatment in Alzheimer's disease have negative amyloid PET scans. And by definition, this excludes Alzheimer's disease. So using clinical criteria, the traditional way that's been done for many decades requires the presence of dementia. So you can only make the, di the diagnosis late in the disease. And it's only moderate accurately, moderately accurate even at that late stage. Mild cognitive impairment or MCI precedes dementia, but this uh, syndrome has variable definition and low disease specificity. So mild cognitive impairment is a symptom, not a diagnosis. And only 50% of patients with MCI will progress to AD dementia. 15 to 20% will have other dementias, but importantly, up to 40% do not develop dementia on follow-up. So we need better investigations to um, categorize our patients and give accurate diagnosis and prognosis in an increasingly large proportion of the patients who are presenting with concerns about their memory. So there are many causes of dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the single most common, makes up about 60% of cases and plays a role in another 10 or 20%. Peak onset of Alzheimer's is in the late 70s. I think it's about age 78. So-called early onset Alzheimer's disease is used to describe onset of this condition below the age of 65, but this is relatively rare. And there is an autosomal dominantly inherited form of Alzheimer's disease that makes up less than 1% of cases with disease onset in the 30s and 40s. Probably the next uh, most frequent cause of dementia diagnosed at post-mortem is dementia with Lewy bodies, and it makes up about 10% of cases. Frontotemporal dementias uh, cause dementia with a peak onset in their 50s, so before the usual onset of Alzheimer's disease. An increasingly well-recognized condition now is late. So this is limbic predominant age-related TDP43 encephalopathy. It's previously been referred to as hippocampal sclerosis of aging, and it's turning out to be quite a common condition in those over the age of 80. In fact, it's believed at post-mortem, you can find evidence of this condition in up to 40% of people over the age of 85. Vascular dementia, just purely due to vascular disease is relatively rare and usually quite obvious in that patients have had frequent or several uh, clinical strokes. Uh, however, it can be related to small vessel disease that may go unnoticed, uh, but it's when present, it's usually part of mixed dementia. So a vascular contribution to the cognitive impairment in patients with Alzheimer's disease is quite common. And if you have evidence of both conditions, we'd call that mixed dementia. And then there are other conditions that may cause dementia, but less frequently, such as cortobasal degeneration and progressive supranuclear palsy. Quick note about structural imaging before we get on to PET. So this is CT or MRI. Uh, for screening purposes, we do structural imaging to exclude masses and look for evidence 
of reversible conditions, subdural hematomas, etc. But we also do it to look for evidence of micro and macro vascular disease, which can give us an idea of the contribution that vascular disease is making to the patient's presentation. And we can look at patterns of atrophy that may help us with a more specific diagnosis. However, atrophy or neurodegeneration, as we also call it, occurs relatively late when symptoms are well established. So MRI is not useful for earlier diagnosis, but in a patient with established disease may give some clues as to the likely etiology. Now, hippocampal atrophy is the classical finding associated with Alzheimer's disease, but unfortunately, it's not specific to Alzheimer's. If it's severe and bilateral, and the age of the patient is greater than 80, then you should seriously consider late rather than Alzheimer's disease. If the severity of the atrophy is moderate and bilateral, then think Alzheimer's disease. If it's mild, think, well, this could be early Alzheimer's disease, but it could also be vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, early, onset, early detection of late, or even normal aging, particularly in those age of the, over the age of 75, when global atrophy, including the hippocampi, becomes relatively common. Hippocampal atrophy may also be present in frontotemporal dementia, but it's usually asymmetrical, and it's usually associated with anterior temporal lobe atrophy or atrophy in the insula and the frontal lobes. It also tends to be more anterior, affecting the amygdala more than the hippocampus. In early onset Alzheimer's disease, once again, that's onset before the age of 65, parietal atrophy may be present without hippocampal atrophy. And in the limbic sparing variants of Alzheimer's disease. So these are atypical presentations with language or visuoconstructional problems rather than the typical memory onset of Alzheimer's disease. They may have no hippocampal atrophy on their MRI. So limbic sparing, by limbic, I'm referring to the hippocampus posterior cingulate type circuit. That's very important for memory function. So positron emission tomography can help us not only in more specific diagnosis of dementia, but also in earlier diagnosis. So here's a cyclotron where we make the radio, um, radio isotopes. They are then pumped into the hot cells where they're incorporated into radio pharmaceuticals, which are then injected into the patient who is then put into the PET camera. And we produce images such as this one, which happens to be of amyloid plaques. So use of PET, particularly FDG PET in dementia is not new. And here you can see some uh, images published way back in the 1980s when the first description was made of the typical findings in Alzheimer's disease, which is parietotemporal hypometabolism. Slow uptake in Australia in clinic has been due to lack of reimbursement and therefore lack of access. But from November the 1st this year, 2021, there is now an MBS listing that will pay for FDG PET for, to assist the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in clinically uncertain cases where better diagnosis will have management impact. Brain cerebral blood, cerebral blood flow SPECT has been available for many decades in Australia and reimbursed by Medicare. However, it hasn't really caught on. The problem is that it's not only less accurate than PET for the detection of Alzheimer's disease, but it gives low contrast images with a lot of noise and therefore the readers and the clinicians referring the patients have had low confidence in the reports. Here you can see an example of a SPECT scan and an FDG PET done in the same patient who had suspected Alzheimer's disease with a mini mental state score of 22 out of 30. So that's mild, but definitely abnormal um, MMSE, uh, consistent with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. And the CBF spec does show a reduction in parietal cortex. And on the surface 
display, they're showing statistically significant areas of reduction. There is some patchy reduction in the parietal and lateral temporal cortex. So the pattern is there, but if you look at the PET on the right, you can see it's far clearer. The contrast between normal and abnormal areas of the brain is much greater, and the quantitative assessment gives a much stronger signal. Does uh, FDG PET have any management impact? Well, we did a study and we published it in 2014 in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, looking at the management impact of FDG PET done in 200 patients referred from the Austin Health Memory Disorder Clinic. So these were clinical referrals uh, in cases where the diagnosis was uncertain. We actually showed that we had moderate to high impact in over 40% of patients. So as you can see from this pie chart, and 57% the FDG PET confirmed the clinical diagnosis and the existing management plan. But in 37%, after release of the FDG PET result, there was a change in the diagnosis of the dementia type or a change in the class of medication. So moving from acetylcholinesterase inhibitors to antidepressants or stopping them or going the other way. And importantly, in 7% of patients, the diagnosis was changed from dementia to no dementia. So for example, severe depression instead of dementia. How good is FDG PET? Well, it's not perfect, but it's better than clinical assessment. So this was a paper put out in 2007 from Berkeley University, where they looked at the sensitivity and specificity of initial clinical diagnosis and FDG PET done at the same time. You can see that the sensitivity of PET was 84. The clinical assessment for AD was 76. Specificity, however, was much higher for PET. 58% for clinical diagnosis versus 74%. And this is against eventual diagnosis at post-mortem. So FDG PET does outperform typical clinical diagnosis when a patient first presents for assessment of uh, cognitive impairment. These studies have been reported uh, of FDG PET versus pathological diagnosis. Uh, some of the cohort, however, were selected. They were typical ADs versus classically normal people. But overall, we can see the sensitivity of PET is quite high, 85 to 94%. And specificity, not quite as good. I guess this is the Achilles heel of FDG PET. The specificity, meaning the ability to distinguish between different types of dementia, uh, and occasionally false calling false positives uh, is around 75% or so, although in one paper it was actually 98% when the study was confined to patients with dementia with either AD or frontotemporal dementia. Way back in 2007, the International Work Group established new criteria for Alzheimer's disease, trying to get more accurate and earlier diagnosis. And they said dementia is not required, uh, but you do need a clear history of progressive cognitive decline. And for Alzheimer's disease, that's classically memory. And this had to be present on psychometric testing. And then this had to be supported by characteristic abnormalities, either on CSF examination, which is a low, uh, finding a low amyloid beta 42 and a raised tau and phosphate tau, or on neuroimaging studies with MRI showing hippocampal atrophy, FDG PET showing the typical temporoparietal pattern, or amyloid PET being positive. These criteria have moved on a bit since 2007, and the greater emphasis now is on amyloid and tau, demonstrating amyloid or tau present, so, so the specific neuropathology. But these uh, techniques are not widely available around the world, unfortunately. Um, for diagnosis, although in many European countries, CSF is routinely uh, done as part of the workup and does give these answers. So something practical now, how do we do FDG PET? Well, at Austin Health, we've been doing about 1,000 FDG brain PETs per year for the assessment of cognitive impairment. This is how we do it. 
Patients have to fast for at least four hours. We check their blood sugar level. We take a fairly lenient approach because if the patient is always known to have a raised blood sugar level, there's no point rebooking them. But if it's greater than their usual levels, we will rebook them, uh, hoping that next time they come back, they have more of their usual level. If it's over 10, uh, in fact, probably if it's over nine, maybe even eight, there is some diminution in quality of the FDG brain PET study. Basically, what it does is tends to smooth out the image. So the contrast between abnormal and normal images is a bit harder to detect. We use 185 to 200 megabecrels of FDG. Uh, they, they are injected in a dimly lit, lit room and told to rest quietly for 30 minutes. We then do a 15 minute scan, although sometimes it's only 10, but you may wish to do a 20. If you have a digital PET CT, then you can use lower dose or shorter acquisition time. It's very important to check for head movement to make sure your low dose CT is well aligned with your PET. That's a quick way of checking to see if there's been significant head movement. If there has been significant head movement, uh, you may need to repeat the test because it can give you false positive results. So rotating the head will make one side of the brain look brighter than the other, and that can be misinterpreted. Uh, reading is done visually. We usually use a color scale, um, such as the one you see in these images, and we always do a database comparison and we use Neurostat 3D SSP in our institution. But there are many programs available for doing this semi-quantitative uh, database comparisons. And importantly, it is a criteria of the new MBS rebate that you include a database comparison uh, in your report. Uh, now, when you have the brain, you need to make it straight. So you put it into the ACPC plane. That's the typical MRI plane where the bottom of the occipital lobe and the bottom of the frontal lobe are in a horizontal line in the mid-sagittal image. Then when you look in your transaxial slices, you can see the primary sensory motor cortex right in the middle of the brain. Anterior to that is the prefrontal and frontal lobes cortex. And behind that is parietal cortex. And it's one of the important features is to judge the uh, metabolic activity in the frontal and parietal association cortex compared to the primary cortex of the sensory motor strip. So this is a very important plane when you're assessing um, for hypometabolism. This is uh, interpretation of FDG PET dementia broken down to its most basic. So somebody with cognitive impairment sent along for an FDG PET, you find hypometabolism. If it's anterior, meaning frontal and anterior temporal, the patient has frontotemporal dementia. If it's posterior, meaning in the temporoparietal regions and also including the posterior cingulate, then they either have Alzheimer's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies. If the posterior cingulate is spared and the occipital cortex is involved, particularly if it's the medial occipital cortex, then you should be thinking about dementia with Lewy bodies. Those areas, uh, occipital lobes generally are not involved in Alzheimer's disease. You may get some involvement of the lateral occipital lobe, but not the medial occipital area. And the cingulate gyrus is in most cases of Alzheimer's disease reduced in metabolism. So when you're reading brain FDG PET, you need to compare the parietal cortex to the sensory motor cortex and the frontal cortex to the sensory motor cortex. You need to specifically look at the posterior cingulate and see how this compares to other cortical areas. You need to look at the visual association cortex uh, and the primary occipital cortex should look as bright or brighter than the frontal cortex and the basal ganglia of the striatum or the putamen. The striatum consists of the putamen and chordate nucleus, but you can think of them together as one thing. You should check for sub the subcortical structures. So 
check your chordate nucleus and putamen and your thalamus for evidence of small defects that may indicate lacuna infarction and therefore a vascular contribution to the cognitive impairment. And you should check for asymmetry, which is particularly prominent in frontotemporal dementia and corticobasal degeneration. And don't forget to look specifically at the anterior and the medial temporal lobes. The anterior temporal lobes are involved in semantic dementia form of FTD. The medial temporal lobes are particularly reduced in late. Interestingly, they're somewhat spared in Alzheimer's disease, despite the emphasis on hippocampal atrophy. Paradoxically, in more advanced cases of Alzheimer's disease, you see greater hypometabolism in the lateral temporal cortex than you do in the medial temporal cortex. So just to hammer things home, this posterior cingulate, well, this is where it is. If you look at the arrows, it should be the brightest region on that particular slice of the brain in the transaxial display. So I've got three examples here. In one, we can see that it's actually much brighter than the surrounding parietal and the medial parietal region, which we call the precuneus. So it's sitting by itself. It looks like an island, and we call this the cingulate island sign. And it's a feature of dementia with Lewy bodies. In the middle one, the rest of the pet looks fairly normal. There may be some subtle reduction in the left parietal cortex. The posterior cingulate, not quite the brightest thing on the slice, but it's not clearly abnormal. On the right, we have a fairly severe case of Alzheimer's disease. You can see how severely the metabolism is reduced in the parietal cortex, but you've got sparing of the sensory motor cortex, sparing of the primary visual cortex, but the posterior cingulate in this case has virtually disappeared. So the next comment there, medial occipital or primary visual cortex should be equal to the striatum. I haven't got any, an example here to show you, but that's the way I assess uh, for this. If it's down, then either the patient has visual impairment, so it is desirable to know whether the patient has visual impairment due to diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, macular degeneration, some other anterior sort of um, visual apparatus type problem to explain occipital hypometabolism. Otherwise, it can complicate your interpretation and cause some confusion between Alzheimer's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. Now, database comparison I mentioned. So this is compulsory now if you're going to claim a Medicare rebate for FDG PET to assist diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Three-dimensional stereotactic surface projection, SSP programs, are the most widely way, used way of doing this because they're quick and they're very helpful. They compare a large number of points, in fact, every pixel, uh, on the spatially normalized brain surface, compare it to a database that's uh, contained within the program of healthy control, FDG pets, hopefully age matched, and display the results then on a surface projection of the brain from, from, from right and left and medial above, below, et cetera, as a color Z score. So a Z score tells you the number of standard deviations. So the Z score is two. It means that particular color means that part of the brain is two standard deviations below the normal, uh, the mean average of the normal subjects. The real advantage of this sort of display is it highlights the regional pattern of cortical areas with statistically significant deficits. So it's a tremendous visual aid. It improves reader speed, accuracy, and confidence. Most pet camera vendors or analysis software vendors can supply these semi-quantitative SSP analysis programs. Now, many programs also give a great big long list where they've actually tell you the Z score for all sorts of parts of the brain. I don't find these particularly helpful. I think looking at the pattern uh, that's enhanced by the surface projection of these Z score color scales is the, where the real value comes 
from this sort of quantitative or semi-quantitative analysis. Uh, the literature attests to how superior the performance is when you use Neurostem. So this is a review of all diagnostic imaging modalities used to contrast to distinguish Alzheimer's disease from healthy controls that have been published to date back in 2013. And this was the, bit, the section on FDG PET. Each point represents a peer review published study comparing Alzheimer's to healthy controls. And then on the left, we have the positive likelihood ratios. And you can see that when Neurostat was used, the positive likelihood ratio for that particular study was much higher than when the study relied on visual reporting. We, in fact, did a study back at the Austin uh, quite some time ago, and we looked, looked at 68 patients with Alzheimer's disease and 32 uh, normal healthy controls. Uh, the ADs all had positive amyloid PET and the controls all had negative amyloid PET. Their mean age was 72. Uh, I'm expert one on this, and my visual sensitivity was 84 for FDG PET, 97% specificity. So a bit the other way around to a lot of the literature. When I used Neurostat alone, I got exactly the same results. However, we also got two relative novices. Uh, one was a nuclear medicine physician with some experience reading PET, but not a lot, FDG PET. And one was a registrar who'd seen a few FDG PETs and had a bit of instruction, but not a lot of ongoing experience. You can see that their performance was as good as mine when they used Neurostat. In fact, Novice 3 was exactly the same as me. They didn't do so well on visual interpretation. So Neurostat actually turns a beginner into an expert and it's incredibly easy and fast. And here's some examples. So all uh, staff in my institution keep this particular image next to them when they're reading FDG PEP, because it shows you the classical patterns you're looking for. So Alzheimer's disease on the top, in this case, uh, it's worse in the right hemisphere, and you can see quite severe hypometabolism, up to seven, Z score of seven, or in other words, seven standard deviations below the normal mean group in the parietotemporal cortex on the right, quite severe reduction on the left. And on the medial views, we see a reduction in the precuneus, which is the posterior medial part of the parietal lobe and the posterior cingulate gyrus. The next line is logopenic aphasia variant of Alzheimer's disease. These are patients with AD who present with a non-fluent speech disorder rather than a memory problem. It looks like AD, but it's worse on the left. And there's a bit more involvement of the dorsal lateral frontal cortex, which is where Broca's area lives. Below that, we see dementia with Lewy bodies, looks like AD, but also involves the occipital cortex, both on the lateral views and the medial views. Below that, we have the behavioral subtype of frontotemporal dementia. There's hypometabolism in the frontal lobes, and running up along what looks like the sylvian fissure, that represents um, reduction in the insular and perisylvian regions. There's also a reduction on the medial views in the anterior striatum. So it involves the caudate nucleus and uh, part of the putamen. But also just above that, maybe you can see my arrow, there's reduction in the anterior cingulate gyrus. You'll notice in this case, there's also some very mild reduction in parietotemporal cortex, and maybe a little bit around the precuneus. Uh, and that is uh, quite common. You do see mild abnormalities in more AD relevant areas in patients with frontotemporal dementia, but the predominant abnormality is in the frontal and anterior temporal regions. The next case, is progressive non-fluent aphasia subtype of frontotemporal dementia. Again, these are patients presenting with a progressive non-fluent uh, speech disorder. And in this case, the disease, which is 
mainly a towel-based disease, is in the left dorsal frontal cortex. You can see it there on the lateral views, but also there on the medial views. And this is knocking out Broca's area, which we know is associated with uh, hesitant or non-fluent speech problems. The bottom line is semantic dementia, another subtype of FTD that's related to TDP43. In this case, however, the hypometabolism is in the anterior pole of the left temporal lobe. So a bit about Alzheimer's disease. It's the most common neurodegenerative disorder, as I said earlier. You look for mesial temporal lobe and parietal atrophy on MRI. The pathological changes are beta amyloid plaques and tau neurofibrillary tangles. PET shows hypometabolism initially in the posterior cingulate gyrus. So in the mild cognitive impairment phase of uh, Alzheimer's disease, what we call prodromal AD or MCI due to AD, you may just see reduction in the posterior cingulate gyrus, and you may only see it if you use a neurostat or some other similar display. It's not visually very obvious. Then there's involvement of the adjacent precuneus and the posterior temporal and parietal lobes. There may be some asymmetry, uh, but the asymmetry if present involves all structures, you don't see something down on the right and something down on the left in another part of the brain. If things are down, they'll all be down on the same side. In more advanced cases, it progresses to the prefrontal association cortices. Uh, there is preservation, however, of primary cortex. Alzheimer's patients don't go blind and they don't become paralyzed because the sensory motor cortex as well as the primary visual cortex is not affected by Alzheimer's disease pathology. You don't see amyloid plaques there and you don't see tau tangles there. Uh, neither do you see uh, abnormality on FDG PET in the basal ganglia in Alzheimer's disease or in the cerebellum. So this is a classic uh, diagram published in 1996 from Eric Ryman in the New England Journal of Medicine, showing these areas of the brain that are typically involved on FDG PET in Alzheimer's disease. So PA refers to parietal cortex, and you can see it there in the top left uh, here, lateral parietal cortex. If you go medially, then the precuneus, which is this posterior part of the parietal lobe, uh, and the posterior cingulate are involved. You have the lateral temporal cortex, but not the anterior temporal pole. And then as the disease progresses, you get frontal involvement as well. And it's often a bit more extensive than you see here, particularly in more elderly patients. So here's a patient with early onset Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they're under the age of 65 and they presented with symptoms, and the FDG PET was very abnormal. And this is typical for early onset AD. The findings are very striking, uh, much more severe than you find in somebody the age of 75 or 80 with Alzheimer's disease. We can see the sensory motor sparing, but if you look in front of the sensory motor cortex and behind it, you can see there's significant hypometabolism. It's very severe in the parietal cortex uh, and it's passing down into the lateral temporal cortex. The visual cortex is spared. The striatum is relative, is spared. Um, posterior cingulate is disappearing. You can just see a little dot of it if you look carefully in these areas. The cerebellum is preserved. And down in the temporal lobes, there's a sort of bit of global reduction in this case, but not particularly uh, lateral or medial. And this is what that patient's uh, Neurostat 3D SSP looks like. Now I should explain what these abbreviations here. This is cerebellum, this is global, this is thalamus, and this is pons. The reason there are four rows is because you have to normalize your scans to something. So you have to take the activity and divide it by an area of the brain that hopefully is not involved in the pathological process so that you correct for features such as uh, 
dose injected, size of the patient, et cetera, and global cerebral blood flow. So if you use the cerebellar cortex as your reference region, uh, then this is the Neurostat, the 3D SSP statistical display. Uh, but however, sometimes it's better to use the global brain. Uh, thalamus and pons have been postulated by some groups, but I don't find them particularly helpful. I mainly, I really just look at the cerebellar and the global. Uh, they tend to fluctuate a bit. One may be more sensitive, while the other may be more specific at showing you the pattern you're looking at. So I uh, like to look at both of those rows. And you can see the classical parietotemporal frontal sparing of the sensory motor cortex it's bilateral and on the medial views reduction the posterior cingular precuneus bilaterally so that was a pretty classical well very classical distinctive uh, scan this one's pretty good too this patient's age 79 with alzheimer's disease it's a little less clear cut there's more frontal and even some medial occipital hypometabolism in this example this could be a reflection of some visual impairment causing the medial occipital reduction. The frontal reduction may be due to a bit of atrophy of aging, or there may be some other factors involved, such as some subcortical white matter disease. Um, and you can get varying levels of frontal involvement in Alzheimer's disease. So it could even just be all due to Alzheimer's disease. But the pattern is still there. Uh, as I said the in this case the cerebellar pattern looks more extensive the global normalization pattern is more restrictive but in the classical areas uh, apart from this medial orbitofrontal region which is a little bit off but the predominant abnormality is alzheimer's disease uh, interestingly fdg pet uh, also reflects where tau is in the brain. So this is showing on the top row, a typical Alzheimer's patient. This is the FDG PET surface display. This is the tau PET surface display, showing a close match of where the tau is versus where the hypometabolism is. Now, I did mention there are some atypical presentations of Alzheimer's disease, so atypical variants. One is called posterior cortical atrophy. And this somewhat spares the limbic memory circuit and instead takes out some of the occipital lobe or the occipital lobes as well as the parietotemporal lobes. And here you can see an example of that. There is involvement of certainly lateral occipital as well as the usual Alzheimer's type uh, areas. And in this case, there is a lot of tau in the occipital cortex. Logopenic variant of primary progressive aphasia, as mentioned, it's more left-sided. So in this case, you just see it here on the left. And the tau in this case was a little bit more predominant on the left. And then that there is a frontal or disexecutive uh, presentation of Alzheimer's disease. This is one that's very confusing because when you see these FDG pets, you're not sure whether you're dealing with frontotemporal dementia because they look like it clinically, but the pet shows uh, involvement of the frontal lobes, but also parietal temporal. And I'll give you a, uh, a bit, of, bit later on, I'll come uh, tell you how to address this sort of diagnostic dilemma. And in these cases, there's tau in these areas. So hypometabolism patterns reflect the clinical presentations as well as the distribution of tau. And they can help differentiate between typical and atypical AD, but particularly when it's AD versus FTD, but sometimes it's a little bit confusing. Uh, just an incidental note, tau tends to be specific to the clinical presentation of the patient, the distribution of tau. Amyloid's not. All these people will have amyloid everywhere in their brain. Uh, here's an example of an amyloid scan showing the global uptake everywhere except the primary sensory motor cortex and the medial occipital lobes, that is. Uh, so it's just a bit of a curiosity. Dementia with Lewy bodies is the second most common form of dementia in people over the age of 65. The clinical presentation uh, is a typical triad. They have fluctuating levels of cognitive arousal. So they might be good one day, bad the next, 
uh, not making much sense, a bit confused. Um, talk to them a few hours later and they're much better, much brighter, but then, again, then a bit later on, they've gone down again. Whereas our time is disease are fairly level, although as it advances, they do get so-called sundowning, in which they perform worse at the end of the day than at the beginning. Uh, more characteristic is visual hallucinations in dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinsonism. The FDG PET looks a bit like AD with bilateral parietal and posterior temporal reduction, but as, as I've mentioned, shows exhibital hypermetabolism. There's rel relative preservation of the posterior cingulate, the cingulate island sign. Uh, note, if you've got access to dopamine transporter imaging with PET or SPECT, this shows abnormal striatal uptake in dementia with Lewy bodies, but not in Alzheimer's disease. The dopaminergic system is not affected by Alzheimer's disease. So it's actually, so dopamine transporter imaging is an excellent test for distinguishing DLB from AD, but you may not have easy access to it, particularly in Australia. Now there are overlaps of uh, DLB with Parkinson's disease dementia. It's really part of a spectrum and Parkinson's disease dementia has the same FDG PET findings as DLB. So here's a case of DLB, and I've got arrows showing the temporoparietal, but also lateral and medial occipital hypometabolism. And note how reduced the occipital lobe is compared to the striatum, which is quite bright in this case, or with the frontal cortex, which is also much brighter. And in this case, there is clearly a cingulate island sign. So uh, we published this in 2009. Here's another case, looks like AD, but the visual cortex is down. Again, it's much less. If you look down here at the big arrow, compared to the striatum. So here's the putamen, here's the chordate nucleus, here's the thalamus, but the striatum is considerably brighter than the medial occipital cortex. And there is sparing of the posterior cingulate, so a cingulate island sign. This is the neurostat showing involvement of occipital cortex as well as parietal cortex. Now this particular feature in the medial frontal, inferior uh, medial frontal region is a bit of an artifact. Sometimes uh, these programs don't quite fit the brain to the standard size brain because that's the first thing they have to do. A bit of edge detection and stretching of the brain. If there's enlargement of the lateral ventricles, you often get this sort of appearance uh, around the region where it thinks there should be brain, but in fact, there's lateral ventricles. So it's uh, displayed, but it hasn't found that very accurately. So it falsely attributes hypometabolism to those areas where there's actually an overlap with the lateral ventricles. There is a catch with diagnosing DLB with PET. The pattern can also be seen in limbic sparing variants of Alzheimer's disease to some degree, although what by that I mean the posterior cortical atrophy variant of AD. So you you always want to correlate with clinical features. Hopefully you'll have enough information uh, on the referral to know whether you're looking for DLB or whether it's just a straightforward or, or is this a, a case that's more consistent with AD. Uh, one clue, uh, DLB is much more common in males than females. And I do tend, if I'm not certain, I do tend to side with DLB if it's a male and Alzheimer's disease if it's female. The other catch could be Alzheimer's disease with visual impairment. So it's good to know what the patient's visual acuity or whether they've got any visual problems, as I mentioned earlier. And um, a bit of a clue could be looking at their blood sugar level as to whether they've got uncontrolled diabetes, for example. So clinical correlation is always important. Oh, another spectacular uh, trap for beginners is to look at a scan, say this person's got AD and it turns out to be a 21 year old with temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, temporal lobe epilepsy impairs the, is associated with hippocampal atrophy and memory impairment. 
and that affects the whole limbic memory circuit. So they do get some reduction in the posterior cingulate and precuneus as well. So don't be trapped by that. Some patients with uh, temporal lobe epilepsy have an FDG PET that looks a bit like Alzheimer's disease. Frontotemporal dementia syndromes. Uh, I've got three of them here. Behavioral variant I mentioned. These are the classic um, badly behaving type um, frontotemporal dementias. They lose their manners. They lose empathy. There's inappropriate behavior. Uh, they do become apathetic. So they tend to just want to sit around, watch TV and drink sweet, eat sweet foods all day. There is a dietary change and generally it's towards uh, excess consumption of sweet foods. And then they have some mannerisms, sort of little habits that become a bit uh, obtrusive, such as bouncing their leg or clicking their tongue or whatever. Semantic dementia. Uh, this is a progressive language problem. People uh, have trouble finding words and they particularly lose understanding of words. So you can tell them a word, say, what is an elephant? And they say, elephant, mm, I don't know what an elephant is. So they're still fluent, but their language becomes superficial because they're losing the understanding of what they're looking and seeing and speaking and reading. In this condition, hypometabolism is seen in the anterior left temporal lobe, particularly pole. Now it can affect the right temporal lobe instead, in which case prosopagnosia, which is inability to recognize faces might be a prominent feature. Progressive non-fluent aphasia is an effortful, hesitant, you can see the patient's really struggling to get words out. Progressive speech problem, which eventually patients become totally mute and then they develop other problems such as behavioral changes, et cetera. And hypometabolism is seen, as I said, in the left dorsal frontal and perisylvian cortex on FDG PET. So frontal hypometabolism. Now a mild reduction is common and non-specific on FDG PET in elderly patients, particularly if your database is using younger patients because the front, frontal lobe metabolism, unfortunately, starts declining from our 20s onward, and it really starts declining from your 60s onwards. Um, if you see moderate to severe frontal hypometabolism, particularly if it's asymmetrical, think frontotemporal dementia, such as the behavioral uh, variant or the progressive non-fluent aphasia variant. You can also see it in chronic schizophrenia, Moderate reduction can be seen in frontal variant of Alzheimer's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy and subcortical vascular disease or early frontotemporal dementia. Mild reduction, quite commonly seen in advanced age, but can also be seen in so-called metabolic uh, problems such as uh, history, uh, excessive alcohol consumption, uh, severe depression, an obstructive sleep apnea. In these cases, it may be reversible with appropriate intervention. So as I showed earlier, this is the behavioral variant of FTD at the top and the semantic dementia variant uh, below. Now, if you're stuck, if you're looking at PET scan and there's some frontal and some parietotemporal hypometabolism and you're not sure which way to call it, uh, simple rule just put it on a balance where the pivot point is in the middle of the brain. And then look at the surface display. If the greater abnormality is anterior and would tip the brain, in this case, uh, anteriorly, uh, then you call it Alzheimer's disease. If the greater area of abnormality is posterior, then it tips it back you call it, out, call it Alzheimer's disease. So anterior frontotemporal, posterior AD. Uh, and there was a report from 2007 actually looking in autopsy confirmed cases that used this very simple approach and claimed to have 98% specificity for frontotemporal dementia. So I use it when I'm stuck uh, and it's a handy little trick because it does appear to work pretty well. 
Now, this is a relatively new entity that's becoming increasingly seen, particularly uh, in the more elderly population. It's late or limbic predominant age-related TDP43 encephalopathy, previously known as hippocampal sclerosis or hippocampal sclerosis of aging or primary hippocampal sclerosis. Uh, at post-mortem, uh, in its first stage, there's TDP43 in the amygdala. In the next stage, it involves the hippocampus. And in later stages, it involves the frontal cortex. So these patients present with amnestic or memory symptoms, just like Alzheimer's disease. They look like a patient with Alzheimer's disease, except they're over the age of 80 generally. They then develop apathy. Uh, that's the next major problem as it moves into the frontal cortex. Their rate of clinical decline is much slower than Alzheimer's disease. And FDG findings are fairly subtle. They look like mild Alzheimer's disease, but they have very severe reduction in the medial temporal regions. So in this uh, uh, representation, this is an average of patients uh, who at post-mortem had uh, late, but they had in-life FDG PET scans. And it shows you the most severe hypometabolism is in the medial frontal region. There is also a reduction but less severe in the posterior cingulate and precuneus, what you don't see is much going on in the lateral, parietal and temporal. So that's a clue. If you don't, if you've got not much going on in the parietal, lateral parietal and lateral temporal regions, the patient's quite elderly and they're amnestic, then you should think late. Here's a couple of... Uh, Examples, uh, this is using um, Cortex ID, which is the GE modification of Neurostat, uh, but it really looks exactly the same as Neurostat. And you can see here on the inferior view, there's severe reduction in the medial temporal regions, worse on the left. There's reduction in the posterior cingulate precuneus, but there's not much going on in the prior to temporal cortex. Here's another example. There is some uh, abnormality here in the orbitofrontal cortex. So I guess by the time uh, this was done, there'd been some progression into frontal cortex. Now, interestingly, uh, this group from the Mayo Clinic found that if you did a ratio of uh, inferior metabolic activity to medial metabolic activity on your FDG PET, and you've got a ratio of greater than 1.25. So this is cortex over hippocampus. So the hippocampus is really going down badly, the medial temporal lobe. So the higher the value, the more likely it is to be late. And they show pretty good distinction between Alzheimer's disease and this uh, hippocampal sclerosis or late. So that's something to keep in mind these days when we're looking at FDG PET have a good look at the reduction in the medial temporal lobe versus the lateral and inferior temporal lobe, and maybe even do a quick calculation um, and looking at the SUVs on each area and see what your ratio is. Vascular dementia, well, I don't think FDG PET's actually particularly useful. MRI is the best investigation for uh, documenting the uh, vascular contribution to cognitive impairment. FDG PET may, however, show cortical or basal ganglia defects. I did mention before that it's important to look for those small defects in the basal ganglia and thalamus that could support vascular dementia. Uh, you may see cortical hypometabolism due to deafferentation of the cortex because of subcortical white matter lesions. And we tend to see this a bit in the frontal lobes. So sometimes we'll have a patient with AD and they've got a fair bit of white matter change, maybe a few small lacoons on their MRI. And uh, when you look at their FDG PET, in addition to the Alzheimer's type findings, you'll find frontal lobe hypometabolism. PET can be helpful in Parkinsonian syndromes. Now in normal idiopathic Parkinson's disease, FDG PET is normal. However, in the so-called Parkinsonian plus syndromes, 
of multi-system atrophy. Uh, there's a couple of forms of this. You may see reduction in the basal ganglia. You may see it in the cerebellum. So there's also an autonomic form for this, but uh, in, this, in those cases, it would just be usually the C reduction, the basal ganglia. So have a good look at the cerebellum as well as the basal ganglia if you're being asked to investigate an atypical Parkinsonian syndrome. In progressive supranuclear palsy, there's reduction in the frontal cortex and in the midbrain, although this example doesn't show that because it's not down at the midbrain, but it is showing a mild diffuse reduction in the frontal lobes. In corticobasal degeneration, there's unilateral frontoparietal and basal ganglia reduction, we can see here. So we've got reduction in frontal and parietotemporal to some degree, uh, but importantly, there's reduction in the striatum and the, uh, the thalamus. And if you went further down, you'd see a contralateral reduction due to cerebellar diaschesis in the cerebellum. So you don't usually get uh, involvement of subcortical structures in Alzheimer's disease. It's quite rare. That should make you think of FTD or corticobasal degeneration. Now they're quite tightly linked. Corticobasal degeneration is usually a tauopathy, similar to many forms of frontotemporal dementia. So it's not surprising that there can be some overlap in the FDG findings because there certainly is in the pathology. Dementia with Lewy bodies we've discussed in detail. Uh, so final slide, I think, uh, is limitations of FDG PET. Now, the hypometabolism on FDG PET is proportional to the clinical deficits of the patient. So findings are subtle in patients with mild cognitive impairment. So have a good look in the posterior cingulate region. Uh, if the patient has mixed features of clinical features of FTD and AD, you're likely to find mixed features on the FDG PET, and then it'll be up to you to try and decide which is the most predominant abnormality. Now, age, I think, is something to keep in mind here. Uh, Alzheimer's disease cases are predominantly in their 70s or 80s. Uh, frontotemporal dementia patients usually present in their 50s, but can be seen in the 60s. And uh, not, it's not unheard of, but relatively rare in the 70s. Um, another problem is that changes are less clear in the more elderly. The older you get, uh, the less distinct your patterns of abnormality on FDG become. So over the age of 75, this can make life more difficult. That's probably because of the presence of mixed pathology. Over the age of 75 at post-mortem, there's often some alpha-synuclein, there's often some TDP43, there's often vascular disease, and there's age-related atrophy of the brain as well. If somebody's over 80, but the FDG PET findings are subtle, think late. So that's a good way to uh, help you out when you're struggling to come to a diagnosis. But it's often, uh, you may often find, as I said, in these elderly people, mixed uh, pathology with a bit of AD, a bit of vascular disease, and a bit of who knows what else. The global sensitivity um, depends a bit on the reader. These things do, but uh, on average, it's probably 85, 90%. Specificity, 70 to 80%. Now, some of that, that specificity is mostly due to these difficult cases. Uh, sensitivity and specificity are higher in the younger patients when the findings are much more obvious. Uh, so it's an age-dependent uh, situation. Uh, findings are also much clearer when patients have moderate severity dementia. So people with an MMSC less than 20 usually have pretty clear-cut findings on an FDG PET scan. So uh, I will stop sharing, and uh, that is the end of this presentation. The second section is basically case-based landing. I think there's about 10, 10 or 11 cases in which there's presentation of pets and questions and then a bit of discussion, and I strongly recommend you undertake that training. Uh, and thank you for your uh, attendance.